Good afternoon, everyone. I, Ankit, on behalf of ANN and Badbani Foundation, would like to invite you all for this webinar and also also introduce our expert, Mr. Tim Matthews. Tim Matthews is the director at Research PE India and heads early stage and startup funding. Tim received his B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras and has pursued his MBA in Finance and Entrepreneurship from Washington University in U.S. Prior to founding Providence, Tim was a part of Emerson Climate Technology in U.S. taking care of competitor acquisition analysis and product strategy. Prior to Emerson, Tim was an Edison Engineering graduate, EEDP, at GE Consumer Products and Satyam Engineering Services working on systems engineering, new product sourcing and product design for global markets. Tim is currently actively involved in fundraising, corporate financial advisory, business modeling and in training and mentoring of entrepreneurs. Before I hand over the floor to Mr. Matthews, a quick note to all our attendees. You will all be on mute. You may ask questions by typing in the panel provided. Our expert will answer the questions after his presentation. Over to you Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Ankit. I'll just go ahead and uh, get started on the business plan. And uh, I think uh, I do not know the composition of today's uh, webinar. How many of you are uh, students? How many of you are businessmen? How many of you are uh, entrepreneurs to be? But I'm assuming that, depend, dip, you know, irrespective of which stage you are, you're all interested in, uh, in having a business plan. My idea is to have about 15, 15 20 minutes worth of uh, presentation. I'll try to run it as quickly as possible. And then I would invite all of you to share your questions because I guess uh, that is more useful for any entrepreneur depending on which stage of business you are. So uh, what I also request is if you can write down questions uh, on if you have on each slide and, and send them across so that you know if, if there's any particular questions, we can directly get to that particular slide. So let me just go ahead and start. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to speak to all of you. Um, and uh, let me just start with a simple definition of business plan that I think is apt. So I've used a lot of uh, explanations from across uh, across the world, and I think this is what I think a business plan should be. A business plan is a living document that outlines various facets of a particular business entity in the short and long term in order to achieve success. And uh, there are there are a couple of things that I, I think are important, which uh, if, if that's all you take away from today's presentation. One is that a business plan is a living document, right? So it is not something that you build and forget. It is something that you continuously build as the business grows. And anyone who's in the early stage or startup or, or just started his company two to three years back knows that business changes, uh, uh, you know, if not on a daily basis, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Now, if you made a document three years back or two years back or a month back or a week back, technology changes, government changes, um, competitor changes, all those issues have to be taken care of and your business plan can, and can go for a toss if you do not take care of all these changes. Uh, another aspect of a business plan is it covers various facets. So you don't just look at you know whether it's marketing or finance or operations uh, or sales, uh, you look at multi-facets and you look at it from different stakeholders viewpoints. Now if you're a CEO, uh, you, you have to take inputs of multiple business heads. If you are a startup entrepreneur and if you're in a one-man army, then you have your customers talking to you about different aspects of it. Now whether you like it or not, a business cannot just be run based on an idea. It has to have a financial model, it has to have a marketing model, it has to have a sales model and most importantly it has to solve an issue and that is you should have a customer base. So I will go through different aspects of it. I want you to know that it's a living document that com, you know, consists of multiple facets. The third point I'd like to raise in a business plan is it talks about both the short and the long term. So you cannot be just you know what is going to happen five years down the line. You also have to address what's going to happen three years down the line, maybe a year down the line or the next six months. So address it from a short term viewpoint as well as from a long term viewpoint. And I'm assuming that nobody wants to make a business plan to achieve failure. So it needs to be geared towards achieving success. Now, as an organization, you know, I started my business with a business plan. And when I started uh, my business, I created a business plan to raise capital. That was the reason that I did it. Uh, once we started business and once we got into the business of fundraising and helping others, we also found that there were many other reasons and I think 
I use a reference. Uh, it was from a website, and this the link is here. So if you if you you know most of it is similar. So there are eight different reasons why a business plan is required for various people. The majority of them require it for raising risk capital. The banks nowadays in India, uh, before you would like to raise a loan, um, ask you to come out with a business plan. It's not as intense as the risk capital business plan, but still is a sizable amount uh, of work. So the second is I would say to raise debt capital and this is the typical debt structure that you're looking to raise. So for example, if you want to increase your overdraft facility in the bank or if you want to talk about having an LC limit or if you're just getting to a bank and want to raise funds on interest, you'd require a business plan. Also if you're raising debt from your friends or family, uh, just, just as a pure interest uh, loan, you also require a business plan. Now once you've set your business and you've raised capital, <coughs> CEOs require or founders require a business plan to attract management talent. So since the business plan consists of a lot of details, you don't want to share it with everybody in the company, but at least you want to share it with the top management that's going to lead the company over the next couple of years. So to attract talent and to show them that this is my vision, and uh, from, from a CEO standpoint to show that this is my vision and to say that this is what we're going to do and in the short term, in the long term, this is how we're going to capture our market, this is the market that we have, uh, this is what need we're trying to solve, you could also utilize it for that. But this is more, I wouldn't say this is from a, uh, this is only from a startup standpoint, this is also from a, a business that is doing about, you know, five to ten crores worth of business. So it's, you know, when, when the, Companies looking to expand to the next level. Business plans are also used for building alliances. For example, if you want to have a strategic partner in, in business, for example, Microsoft or HP or any service provider that, that is going to rely on you or do business with you, a business plan could help. A business plan helps you stay on track. Now, I started the last slide with saying that a business plan keeps changing on a daily basis, weekly basis, or a monthly basis. But at least when you look at it, in hindsight, you sort of have performance measures that you have to stand up against. So if you say, I'm going to achieve, let's say, a, a target of a million dollars and uh, five months down the lane, when you look at your target, you at least know that these are the targets that you're going to be held against. So it helps companies stay on track, companies as well as CEOs. Now, typically every, every member in, the, in, in a company has a boss above him sort of monitor his activities but for a CEO or for the management team they have to self do self checking and a business plan is normally a good self checkpoint where it, it sort of gives you your milestones well ahead so that you can sort of achieve them. Now when you sort of look at your long term and short term it sets out the planning in motion and when you do it on a frequent basis you have the entire team strategizing predicting the future and looking at different scenarios that affect business revenue. So it's, it's a good tool for long-term planning. And because you do look at the business plan for multiple facets, like I mentioned in the last slide, uh, you sort of strategize every different business scenario. So you look at it from a business revenue standpoint uh, and also at every sort of growth pattern and scenarios that could happen. So you could get positive signs or you could get negative signs, uh, but at least it sets out the planning in motion well ahead. Now if you have if you have a mid-sized company with, with different teams, I'm assuming marketing team, sales team, uh, finance team, your business plan also is a to-do statement for most of these guys. So, you know, the marketing plan which is embedded in your business plan is a good document for the marketing team so that they know what the vision of the company is and they can, they can follow that. Last but not least, the business plan is also used to monitor the entire company per se and how you achieve the overall business goal, right? So it's, it helps you keep a tab on the current operations. Now, I have ranked them based on the order that I have been operating the business and I have seen clients. So we have helped clients build business plan for attracting talent, long-term planning. And majority of them, I would say about 90, 95% of them to, to raise capital. Now, let's let's get de directly into a good business plan. You know, um, I cannot explain to you in 15, 20 minutes how how detailed each of them should be. But what I can do is sort of tell you that if I was to analyze a business plan from a fundraising standpoint or from a business standpoint, 
I would require these 12 topics. You know, and again, each of these topics goes into further into um, 10 different or you know, five or six different uh, aspects of it. So I let me let me sort of give you a brief overview. Uh, a business plan in, consists of uh, executive summary, um, a company overview, a team overview, a product or service overview, a proof of concept, the uh, market dynamics, which is the market size, trends, and opportunities. Uh, something that talks about the competition, definitely about your business plan, business model. You also talk about your operations, how you going to achieve what you think is the uh, goal of your business. Uh, you'll have to address the sales and marketing aspect of business and most important of all the revenue forecasting, how much money you require and what the structure of funds that comes into your business would be. Now every investor, I, I'm assuming that all things from 1 to 11 are good things about your company, you know, positive things. Investors also would like to hear negative things about the company and that you sort of address in the potential risks and gaps. So coming back to aspects of a business plan and what a good business plan consists of, I would say invariably a business plan needs to have these, uh, these topics in it. Now depending on the nature of business, for example in a, in a startup, you would have proof of concept as a big part. You know, your proof of concept is going to be a, a big important part of it for a startup or an early stage. In an early stage also the, the investor is investing into your team and because it's an early stage or a startup, you know, they, they would want to see more focus on the team and the product that you're offering. Because it's an early stage, they want to see whether there's a market size, market for it and if, if there, is, there is a requirement, uh, what are the opportunities that you have in the market size. Not so much about the operational sales uh, or the risks and gaps because they know it's a startup. Whereas for an established business, you know, obviously the team is important, but what I think is the most important is the business model, uh, the operations, how the current company is doing, sales, how the company is doing in sales, and obviously the revenue aspect of it. And because it's a mid-size, most of them would have CEOs, CFOs from established uh, institutes or repute or experience. So, you know, this sort of takes a backseat. The team takes a backseat. Since the business is an established business, the, the investors assume that the proof of concept is already established. Otherwise, you'd not be surviving. So depending on the stage of business that you are and also the industry that you're operating in, different aspects of a business plan comes into the picture. What we've also seen is that every, every investor who invests into a company has different requirements. So some investors are very high on documentation. So before you even go for fundraising, they would want to see your business plan. Some of them are more interested in listening to your business idea. So you know you can have a team in a cafe or in a meeting with them where you sort of explain what the business plan is. But invariably, all of them ask you to put your idea onto a plan so that they can see it. And not only because they want to see a business plan, they also want to see how you've thought through uh, your business. And a very detailed business plan is always a good sign. And while I say this more often, a business plan is not a precursor for, for getting funded. You know, if, you, if you've got funding, some people have raised funding without a business plan. Majority of them did have a business plan in some format or the other. But there are cases where people have drawn up their ideas on tissue papers and napkins and got funded also. So while I say that you know, a business plan is not 100% required to get funded or, or raise fundraising, Having it helps you get your foot into the door and also establishes that you know you're serious about your business and a well laid business plan is always uh, seen as a very good uh, sign of your interest in the business. Now coming, coming to, you know, I'm assuming that none of you are interested in doing a business plan just for the academic exercise. Uh, while there are students who are doing their MBA in a business school, uh, they look at a business plan more as an academic exercise where they get you know, where they get marks for making a good business plan. I'm not, I'm not talking about those business plans, I'm just talking about in general why business plans are used. So when we, when we say that the business plan is made and the top reason that we make a business plan is for fundraising, uh, let me get on the other side and just give you an insight onto what investors look for uh, when, when we sort of get to a business plan. So the main aspects that investors look for, A, 
is the business idea feasibility. So if you want to sell sell water to people in a village that has no water, you have to establish that there is a need in the market and you're addressing a need with the business that you're planning to start. So A, they look for business idea feasibility. Business idea feasibility does not mean that you, could, you need to be the first in the market. There could be a business idea that's already there and you could be improving upon it. So a business idea does not have to be novel, but they just want to see if you have an idea that you've thought through and it's addressing a need and there is definitely a market for it. The second most important thing that they look at is the owner and the team credibility. And this I would say is across the board. So whether you're raising net fund or whether you're raising equity fund from either angels or super angels or VCs or private equity, owner credibility is very important. The third in, in, in terms of what they look for is the business model. And no matter what you think, uh, an investor who has been investing in businesses receives at least about two to three business plans on a minimum per day. Now, anybody who signs up and says that I'm going to share your business plan might think that the person who's reading the business plan might not know that much about business. So if, if your job from morning to evening was to give money to people, you have to assume that he's going to do a good job of it. So we cannot assume that the person that's reading it does not understand my business model. So when you do your business model part of your business plan, then you have to give it a lot of thought and make sure that you do not pull the numbers out of the air and everything that you put in is based on actual factual data. An important part of your business plan is the market size currently available in the market or a market size that's there a couple of months down the lane, a couple of years down the lane. It can be, in, in, you know, you could be an early mover where you could say the market size does not exist now, uh, but it exists, and I know it exists, but it takes time to create it. You know, that is something that you have to mention in your business plan because an investor is definitely interested in it. Uh, another important part is scalability. And you have to remember that every investor will look at your business from a scalability standpoint. So if you if you want to build a business that is more scalable, chances are that you might not get funding from a VC or a PE uh, or a super angel because scalability is something that they look at. But scalability is important because you have to understand any investor who invests into your business also wants to make an exit. Now when they make an exit, typically the person who invests funds at the next uh, and would invest more than what the current investor has put. Now, if the business is not scalable, there is no need for funds at the latest time, so there might not be an exit for investors. Now, I also touch upon that as the last point, you know, you have to address exit options for investors. But scalability indirectly leads to exit options. You talked about the market size, you talked about scalability, but if there is no opportunity for, for, for grabs, then an investor will not be interested. So for example, if there's a great market, but there's already 100 people operating in that market, then there is no opportunity. Or if the product is too difficult, or if it's, you know, if it's cumbersome to make it, and if the, if the investor thinks that there is no way that you can grab that opportunity, then now for early stage companies and growth companies, uh, you often require funds for growth, you know, for setting up the team, or for marketing, or for working capital. Now, what investors look for is if you require uh, funds for doing that, then you have to have established your business model and revenue model. Now, I also call it as proof of concept. What they're looking for is A, have you built a product? Have you tested it in the market? Have you shown it to people? And based on those assumptions, have you then redrawn your assumptions for the business model? So people look for some sort of proof of concept and whether to see if your revenue model and business model is already established or not. Sometimes there are businesses which do not have revenues in the first couple of months. In that case, you at least need to show attraction with respect to your customers. So for example, you might have a product that you might be currently selling for free, but if you do not show that your business model is validated and that customers are currently taking your product but not paying for it, at least then an investor would definitely be interested. But if you do not show any traction, whether in revenue, or in business model or in customers, then an investor would say, go and find an invest, go and find some customers and then come back to you. 
or show me a list of all the customers you've got in the last five to ten months, or five days, or one month, or last couple of years, so that I can understand that you will take my money and definitely look at expanding the business model. And so the you know one of the things that it's in the back of the investor's mind always is the return that they would get on their money. Now. All of you have heard about Make My Trip and, 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 and the funding that is received. So not every company is like Make My Trip. Not every company can give you as much investment returns as, uh, as, as large companies can. And not everybody is in the same growth pattern as most companies are. So but whatever the, the return you're, you're planning for your own company, you have to lay it out and say for every one, one rupee that I get, you know, I'm looking to return, let's say, right so if you give me a one rupee check today I will give you 20 rupees after let's say five months or ten months or uh, in a year's time but at least you have to be clear about it and again that will come back from your revenue model so your revenue model and business model would drive the returns that you can give uh, to a customer or to an investor sorry now all these again are what you promise to an investor, whereas the investor also wants to know if you've done a good check or a reality check on the business. So they also are interested in all the competition and the risks that are involved in the business. Now every business has risk, every business has competition in some way or the other. Some, some ideas are unique and they might not have direct competition, but they might have indirect competition. Right? So it's important for you to address direct, indirect as well as risks that are there in the market. So some risks could be regulatory, some risks could be government, some risks could be seasonal. So for example, tax business is seasonal. Uh, you know, if you're an insurance selling business, then you have IRDA or the government, which, which has very strict norms for operation. So you have to label all those risks and understand that see, it is not bad that you have a lot of risks in your business. What is important is that you have to identify mitigation for all the risk or competition that is out there. So it's, you know, an investor is not going to you have so much competition, you have a lot of risk, and you don't want to invest. If your business model is good, if the return is good, and you identify that there are risks, but I plan to mitigate those risks by using A, B, C, D, E techniques. That is what an investor looks for. Now, all said and done, if you present something that's really wonderful, you've done a great job, but you, you don't have an execution plan, then an investor is going to look at you and say, these are all fine, but where is the result? And that is where you have to lay down the plans in detail, where you talk about the operations, where you talk about milestones, where you talk about deadlines, and you talk about what you're planning to achieve on different aspects. Now sometimes uh, these execution can be guaranteed by funding trenches. So when you raise a fund, Companies tend to raise or get their investment based on certain milestones that they've achieved. So these execution timelines are very, very important. Because an investor might say, okay, you have promised to reach 10 lakhs in the next two months. But if so, if you don't promise to show a VT plan of growth, an investor might not put in the 10 lakhs that he has to put after two months. Coming to the numbers eventually, you know, you talk about investment return, you talk about the business model, um, you talk about competition. Now when you when you come down to the basic facts, finance, which is why uh, you know, most people do business, to make money out of business, you have to address the profitability of a particular business. So for example, some businesses are cutthroat, like trading, where uh, people operate on a margin of 2% up to about 6 to 7%. Uh, if it's generic trading, uh, whereas a lot of businesses typically operate in the 20 to 30 percent margin uh, bandwidth. There are businesses that have 200 percent, 300 percent, 1000 percent margin. Now it depends how you would convince your investor that I would be in a comfortable margin uh, market position and I would be able to increase my profitability based on my position in the market. So you have to convince an investor that I will guarantee that you will get returns on your business because the underlying business model is strong and 
I would be able to generate profits that would come back to the investor. Now, all said and done, um, you know, if you have a short-term investor, you are looking, you know, he's looking to exit in about five to six years. Uh, if you have a long-term investor, then you know, chances are the investor might never exit, or might be forced to exit when funding comes in in the next level. So, but nevertheless, you have to lay down the exit options for an investor so that it attracts him and he knows that he will be able to exit the business uh, five years down the line. So an investor is looking to earn money, help you in the process as well as exit in the short term. Right? So you have to address the exit options as well. Now, you know, I, I will just run through uh, the next slides because I think what's important is to get questions from all of you in the next half an hour and see what, what, what you have or what you face in business. Uh, but if you're looking to address capital, you know, these are a couple of points which I think you, you should address. Uh, what is set up a professional company? I know most of you will start with a proprietorship or a partnership, but when you go for funding, preferably set up a private limited or a LLP, depending on the industry and field that you're in. Most of the investors prefer a private limited, but nowadays LLP is increasing its, uh, its, its predominance in the, in, the, in the early stage startup phase. So if you have um, low funds and then you're looking for more flexibility, LLP might be a structure that you could do. Uh, build a great team. You know, all investors, at least in the early stage and growth stage, know that if the, invest or if the team or the, you know, the management team or the founding team does not stick together, the entire company would go for a flop. So if you're a single man army, try to see if you can have co-founders or not. If not co-founders, at least have um, a good CFO, uh, a person in operations, an IT specialist, so that when you go to an investor for funds, you have a good team to show and make the investor believe that you will be able to deliver on everything that you say. Now, building a, building a prototype before you go to an investor is definite, definitely better than going empty-handed. Now, everybody can say that I plan to do this, I plan to make this, I plan to show it, but if you have a prototype or at least a sample study or, or a product in your hand, either in the physical form or, or in the soft form, you know, the investor can at least visualize the entire uh, business and that definitely increases your chances of getting funds. If you're in the business of protecting, uh, if you have a lot of intellectual property, I would suggest have create patents, you know, if you have a trade secret, fine. At least make sure that you tell the investor that we have trade secrets. If you can trademark it or register your logos or, or anything that you think is valuable property, I would suggest you to do that. A definite win for all investors is customers. You know, anybody would be involved. So if you have 100 customers before you even go for fundraising, an investor would definitely look at you in a different light versus anybody who just goes and says, this is what I plan to do. And, and I don't have the customers yet, but the moment I launch, I would have enough customers. So don't do that mistake. Have as many customers as you can before you go. Even if they don't pay, at least get them on board so that you can use them for attracting funds from investors. Now, you know, the, the worst part of a business plan is if you go and present a document which you just quickly made in two days or, or, or one day in a couple of hours, an investor would be turned down. So remember that while a business plan is not a deal breaker. Uh, a bad business plan can actually ruin your chances. So it's better not to make a business plan than to make a bad business plan. Because what happens is the investor then sees that you've not done a good job and he, he now has a negative, uh, negative opinion about your business uh, versus having no opinion at all. So if you're making a business plan, if you're making something which is at least detailed and you know, has the 12 things that I mentioned, at least make effort to spend a sizable amount of, uh, of time doing it than, uh, than, than just doing a shabby job out of it. And you know, in today's age where you have Google in front of you, if you just Google business plan on Google, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'd find a lot of information that's out there. And everybody has their own way of doing it. So um, some people have three ways of doing a business plan, some people have four ways of doing it. I sort of have accumulated over the years to see every single way in which the investor looks at it and, and that's how we have presented it. And so you can have various ways but 
do a good job of it. And preferably before you go to a raise funding, show it to a couple of friends or people that you think will give you good advice. Uh, so that if there's any mistakes or if there's any things that look out of place or if something matching with what you're saying, then they can point it out to you and you can at least be more thorough with your business plan. Uh, no business plan is complete without a financial model. So make sure at least you have a basic financial model. Um, you know, anybody who knows how to do Excel can you do it in Excel. Anybody who knows how to use a pen and paper can just draw the financial model on paper and just present it on paper. You don't have to have Excel if you think it's too complex and you don't understand a lot of the equations. You can just have it on a you know, plain sheet of paper where you write it down neatly and present it. Um, I don't see any reason why that also would not be interesting to an investor. Um, do not have a very high burn rate. So if you're saving money and you know, having having a very, very small and lean team, that's that's great. Investors love to see entrepreneurs who spend very, very low money. So if you're you know having a party in Taj or or or, or Hayat or Meridian, you know, those are not the guys that would typically be the right kind of investees for investors. So people want to see that entrepreneurs really value the money and really uh, are stringent on on the way in which cash is spent. And, and anybody who has done an MBA or you know is in the professional services hears this word network, 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 network. So that's I would say is a very important part of getting your business plan across. So if you've seen the investor before in a in a conference, either in a Thai conference or in any ENS conference or any of the other entrepreneurship, you know, Indian Angel Network conference. So make sure you exchange cards and discuss your business plan with them much ahead before presenting something. Because they, that sort of arouses the interest in a particular investor. Um, so networking is really important. And you have to leave cash on the table. By what I mean by cash on the table is there are companies that we have, uh, we have, we have seen have very, very high valuation in the startup phase. Now it's very difficult for companies uh, to raise funds if there are very high valuation. No investor would be interested if you are very hard or in your negotiation. Everybody would love to give you money provided you make the money back. So, you know, people look at your business plan and see when they when we, when I talk to you about the have a very good business model. Make sure that the investor who you know, who puts money into your business also makes money in the whole process. Otherwise, you will never chances are that you will not. Uh, get funds from you know, investors. Now, we've, I've been I've been helping entrepreneurs uh, with, with their business plan, and what I, these are these are some typical mistakes I see in the uh, entrepreneurs make often. First of all, some of them say I don't need a good business plan. Some of them say I, we don't have any competition at all. You know, the Xerox is not a competition, or or you know, Microsoft is not a competition. We don't have any competition, so don't make that mistake. Uh, we have the first more advantage. Chances are that you have probably not heard of other competitors. Uh, there might be competitors that the investor has heard of. Uh, people who have been in the industry for a long time uh, tend to have that tend to have that notion that I know everything in this in this industry. So, you know, I know everything, and you don't know anything about this industry is something that I hear sometimes, and that can definitely be a deal breaker. And and like I said, customers are important. So don't say that if I build it, customers will come. Try to build it before you approach an investor and make sure that you have customers before you go. Um, all investors look how much you have invested. So if you have money, either from your parents or from your savings or from your um, you know, salary that you've got, invest your own money into the business. That gives confidence to an investor that you have already you know, put in some skin in the game before uh, before you, the investor comes with money. And, and some, of, some people actually hold their ideas so much that they don't share. Uh, they think that the investor will take the idea and run away. Um, see, the investor is not in the in the business to start businesses. He's in he's in the industry to help entrepreneurs grow. So chances are that he might sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement with you. But otherwise, I think a majority of them don't sign. So don't expect an investor to do it. If you want to share your idea, chances are that he might be interested. But if you say that I will not reveal it to you, it's my idea, then you know, hard luck. Uh, again, this is something that. Um, Guy Kawasaki keeps mentioning in his articles. Uh, I, I found this to be very concise. So, if you if you want to talk about businesses, never say that your projections are conservative. If you've done a good job of your market study, you know, your projections are probably realistic or you know overhyped. Projections, no matter what, are rarely conservative. 
So even though you think it's conservative, chances are that there are a lot of noise parameters uh, that you have not assumed. So you have assumed a market node customers come to you pretty easily, but chances are that the customers really don't come that fast. So projections are rarely conservative. So don't say to an investor that our projections are conservative. You know, and, and another thing is most of them look at business plans and say that, you know, oh, KPMG says my market is $50 billion. Look, do a small analysis of yourself because Indian market is very different from foreign markets. So do a good study of, of your market before you go to an investor. Um, again, the same thing. Nobody else is doing, we don't have any competitive, I don't, nobody else is doing what we do. Um, that's a typical mistake. Uh, overestimating large, uh, sorry, underestimating large competitors. So, you know, don't say, no, no, Oracle is not a threat but because it's too big, it's very slow. You're right, it is going to be slow, but when they do make a plan or when they do go ahead, they definitely have to pump in more money than you can. So they're going to wipe you out. So don't, don't make a statement that you know, your big competitors are too slow. Say that we, we, are, we are younger, but we are faster, uh, rather than saying that competition is, is too slow. And, and last but not least, most of them say that uh, all I need is to get just 1% of the market. Be realistic again, uh, like I said, if you do a good job of your business plan, chances are that you will present realistic information. And, and a couple of other points that I mentioned, you can all read through it. That, that These are all white lies that are invested here. So that sort of brings me to the end. I think I, I sort of want to leave with the, the uh, the slide on so that you know if if I, if I can sort of open it up for questions, we can go ahead on on questions that any of you might have. Open it up for questions. Yeah, we'll quickly move on to the Q&A session. Uh, first question is from Mr. Premnath. Okay. He wants to open a car wash business. So actually, wants okay. to know what should be his B plan constitute of. Uh, Premnath, I think a car wash. I think there's a few companies. Uh, so car wash is pretty famous abroad. Uh, in India, the you know, majority of them have people who come and watch it. So I think what you can do is look at the business models of car wash companies abroad and see how they operate. You will find probably you will find financials online. So I, I would say that if I were you, I would start with an explanation of what you plan to do. And since most of the investors are uh, or have been abroad, they, they understand what your business plan is. So chances are that you know you you already have, a, they already have a good understanding of your business. What I think would be important is to explain the product or the service that you offer. Maybe do a small proof of concept uh, because you can, you can start up with a, maybe a, a community uh, car wash session. You can talk about how much market size is there and see there's not much competition currently. Your competition is very fragmented. So if you have these guys coming in the morning uh, taking about 200 rupees per month for car wash. Uh, you can you can you can actually say that the competition is very fragmented. Talk about your market size. Talk about some proof of concept you've done, and explain your business model. See what's important is water is very scarce in our cities. So if you plan to set up in second tier or third tier cities, there's not going to be as much customers as tier one cities. So explain to them how you're going to address issues like water. Are we going to address issues like power? Are we going to address issues like real estate? Uh, so explain your business model pretty well. Most cities like for example Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Calcutta, Cochin, we are very densely populated. So there's a lot of scarcity of, of, of real estate. How are you going to go about acquiring and eventually how much money you require. So out of these out of these 12 different points I can I can at least say there is a seven top priority one. And you know you can obviously address uh, the risks and gap but I don't think you know because it's a very locational sort of business I think uh, if you cover these points, I think you should be in good shape. Next question is from Mr. Vipul. Is it a good idea to take help of a CA in coming up with financial plan? See, I think I think uh, a chartered accountant is definitely a good uh, a good resource for anybody who's who's planning uh, planning a business plan. Now, the thing is, a chartered accountant by nature is going to be advising you. Uh, to be risk averse because the target accountant is very very particular about his finance. So you have to look at it from from taking the advice of a chartered accountant for the financial aspect, but from the business side of it, you have to look at what the market size is and uh, and and make your projections. So the assumptions that you give a chartered accountant is going to be very important, and that is going to come from you. So you have to do a good job of the assumptions, and then I would say 
if you have a chartered accountant as a friend or as an advisor or as your uh, service provider, definitely take uh, take his inputs because chances are a he will give you good advice and b he might have a good network of uh, investors already, so he might actually help you raise funds also. Our next question is from Mr. Nirmal. We plan to raise fund from angel investors. How should we go about diluting equity? <laughs> that's a that's a that's that's a, probably a, a one day answer. Uh, the simplest way that you would go about diluting equity is the uh, we call it BCF method. I mean, we project uh, the future earnings, and we then understand what what market are we going to capture, and then base your current projections or valuation based on what you would achieve in the future. So typically it's a three to five year plan. Now we call it valuation of your business. Now an angel investor uh, comes in at uh, different levels. So if you're looking at sizable amount of angel investment, let's say uh, anywhere between 20 to 25 lakhs all the way up to a couple of uh, crores, uh, you should get a, a, a valuation of maybe at least a crore you know, at the basic uh, to understand the business as well as you can look at increasing the valuation based on the numbers that you plan to achieve. So if you're a startup and you don't have any revenue at all, uh, then the angel probably would dictate how much money you will get or what valuation you will get. But if you already have revenue and you are profitable and, and can sustain but require the funds for growing, then I think you should get a professional help. Uh, you can talk to me offline, I can, I can further tell you how we do it. Uh, but I think it's going to be important that you don't charge or overvaluate uh, or you know have a high valuation at the first round because in the next round a VC might come in and then have you at lower valuation and the angel would get you know he would lose his money. So it's important that while you protect yourself and don't go for a very low valuation, also beware that there are issues with high valuation. Uh, that is one method. The second is there is something called as convertible uh, convertible Debt. So, if you do not want to uh, arrive at a valuation right now or arrive at an equity right now, you can agree that the valuation will be decided at the next level. And you can also offer a discount on the valuation uh, at the next level. So, when you have an angel, let's say you're getting 25 lakhs or a crore, you can take the money and say that you know when the valuation happens at the next round, I will give you a 50% discount. That means that whatever happens, you know, whatever money the investor comes and puts in money, you would get stake 50% less and all the money that you put in would be evaluated at that round. So that's, that's, that's another way of doing uh, uh, investment or fundraising when you do it from an early stage uh, angel investor. But again, if you, if you need more details, you can, you can, you can talk offhand after, the, after this uh, session is over. How does the investor judge owner credibility? What parameters they look for? Oh, that's very simple, actually. Uh, so, if you if you have if you have uh, if you've graduated from some of the top schools in the country, uh, you know that's a good uh, that's a good way to establish credibility. Um, some of them look at your mark sheet. Some of them look at your company profile. So, if you've worked in good companies like you know some of the top uh, top Forbes 100 companies, top Fortune 500 companies. It definitely adds credibility if you look at the companies, top companies in India, uh, so some of the blue chips or, or the mid-sized companies, if you work for them, it definitely helps. Uh, most of them look at experience, so if you look at, uh, let's say you're starting a fashion business and you are from a uh, uh, construction business, right? So if you're, you're, you've been doing construction all throughout your life and suddenly you want to start a fashion portal, then an investor might think, you know, uh, he might have, take it with a pinch of salt, so that's another way your experience talks a lot about you. If you are a young student and if you're a dropout, then you can you can often say examples of Microsoft, Bill Gates, and, and you know, Apple, Steve Jobs, they're all dropouts. So in that case, how do you establish credibility? Well, uh, the best form of establishing credibility is your customer. So they will directly call up your uh, customers and ask them, has uh, Mr. ABC delivered on time? Has he taken money and ever run? So Investors actually call up your customers and ask them if, if the, the guys that you supply these products, are they, are they faithful or not. So that's another way that investors do. But majority of them call customers. 
eventually. So because no matter which school you come from or which company you come from, uh, when you start business, there are chances that you might get, uh, you, know, you could have legal cases. So they'll check up with lawyers, they'll call up uh, lawyers and check if there's any cases pending. Um, they'll check the police records if you have uh, you know, outstanding records. Uh, they will also primarily call up references to your customers. And many of them would talk to your uh, previous agents. So if a VC comes in, they might talk to angels uh, who are invested and ask them, how is the company doing? Uh, how is uh, the money that you've invested, how are they performing? Right? So these are different checkpoints that an investor looks to check your credibility. Question is, it's from Mr. Srimatesh. What are the minimum return on investment that an investor would look for? Oh, uh, you know, there are businesses that, that, that promise 1000% return in, in four years. There are businesses that look at uh, IRR of 36% year on year. So there are multiple aspects. So, so for example, if you are in a, a technology business, something like a Make My Trip, the returns are humongous. I mean, there is, you cannot expect businesses from, from, from every business to give you as much return as an IT company or a services company. Or a product, so it depends on which industry you are. So if you're in the construction business, you have uh, different returns, and every investor in different industries have different expectations from the business. So, but for an early stage, the expectation is typically high. So an investor looks, on average, an investor looks to uh, make at least three to five times the amount that he's investing in about three to four years. Investors also, after all the due diligence, there are issues that an investor feels. So nine out of ten. Uh, if you take as a as the ratio for success of startups, uh, that normally goes high uh, with, with the age of the business. So if you're in a mid-sized company, you know the chances of success are higher. But for a startup, uh, I would say eight or nine out of ten would fail. So for an investor, he he's expecting that you would at least uh, double his money in a year, or you know give five times returns about five years. I would say that is uh, average. There are companies that give 10 times returns, there are companies that give 2 times returns, um, there are companies that make losses. So I, what, I, what I think is important is every industry has standard expectations which you can look at the stock market or, or from the IPOs that have been coming out recently. Next question is from Mr. Nikhil. Where do we get a list of mentors for any business type industry wise? Please share any URL or a website that you have. Uh, see what something that comes to the top of my mind is if you're uh, I don't know if you're in a tier one or a tier two or a tier three city, but you know there are there are organizations like NEN, uh, uh, the Indian Angel Network. There is organizations like Tide. Uh, there are colleges that have incubators. Now, each of these, if you can just Google them, uh, most of them would have a list of all the mentors uh, on their list. So I've mentioned four or five names. There are more like you know, I think IITs. Uh, in, across all over India have mentors in, in their business incubation centers. What I would also suggest is look at MBA colleges close by and uh, if you're in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, uh, Cochin, uh, I don't think you should have a dearth of uh, a Pune, you, should, you shouldn't have a dearth of good quality mentors. All you have to do is just uh, look at colleges websites, uh, they might have an entrepreneurship club there. Uh, or maybe you can just go to NEN, NEN has a list of mentors, uh, all the IITs, IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi, IIT Madras, all of them have incubators where mentors are mentioned online. Um, then you, you have Thai, Thai also has a list of TIE, they also have a list of mem uh, mentors mentioned on, online. So there are so many ways uh, that you can network and find uh, investors. And if you want, you can just email me, I can, I can, uh, I can tell you a list of even more. Uh, my email is there on the last slide. That's my email address in front of you. So you can email me and see if you know if you need more you can you can get back to me. Next question is from Mr. Subhito. A plan to open a restaurant. What should be the best strategy when planning for in India as the demographics and information not available or closely guarded by different competitors? See the restaurant business um, is is a very, very lucrative business to get into. I mean uh, the margins are good, the, um, you know, the the repeat customers are high, but the problem of restaurants is that, uh, again, I would say they have a very high failure rate. So if you think that there is no business of yours in India that's that's got the information, 
what I would suggest is do a sample study. You know, talk to a couple of people who you think are your customers, and just uh, maybe talk to 15 or 20 customers. And if you can say that, okay, 10 out of 20 customers I've approached would love to come and try my food. I would suggest just do a trial run. You know, have an open house in your house um, where you cook food, or you have a cook uh, do a do a do a tasting session where you invite people and just ask them. You know, uh, would you pay this price to buy this food? And you could just have the session in your home, or maybe you can rent out a small uh, club, or you could rent out a small venue, and just uh, do it that way. So you can actually have a proof of concept, and then use that to extrapolate and predict the market and the importance. You know, but what's important is how you acquire these customers is also important. Another way is I would go. So a lot of business models are available abroad, uh, and not necessarily that every business model that works abroad works in India. So you might have to fine tune the information uh, for Indian customers, but what you would need to do is take their business model, look at it from where it, where you can tweak it for to specialize in your business uh, case, especially. But majority of the uh, restaurant business are very very uh, similar in terms of the issues they face. You face HR issues, you face customer issues, uh, operations issues. So most of them are similar. There might be some with respect to, let's say, if you're opening up a, a South Indian joint or a North Indian joint, uh, you might have a very specific client type. So what's important is for you to understand the demographics of that. And you can just look at the population census and how many people are available in India who like that. Um, if it's city or urban or rural and in rural or urban, what, what is the ratio of uh, you know, uh, medium-sized customers, low-sized customers, or high-sized customers. So there is a lot of available data uh, available online, free of cost. Um, another way would be probably just to go out and see uh, a competitor in the space um, across the country. You know, if, if you're from a small town, go to a bigger town and see if there's a competition, and just sit and count the number of customers that go in per day um, on a weekend, and then you can just calculate Google Maps. I think you should be able to find, find all the information. Yeah, next question is from Mr. Uh, Abhishek Thomas. Does selling a business as an eco-friendly business have any additional value? Yes, definitely. I think, uh, you know, it depends on which industry you're talking about. I know in the organic food section, uh, uh, I think it's a different plus. A lot of cities now have uh, supermarkets that's only focused on organic foods. Um, if you're looking at other businesses, Definitely, there is a plus point. I don't know if you're available, uh, aware of carbon credits. Now, if you if you can get carbon credits for using your business, definitely uh, a lot of businesses would save money by using your technology. So you can convince them. I would say yes. If you would approach it using a green angle, you would definitely get a lot of response. And there are there are investors also who want to invest only in uh, green funds. So you know you could approach them as well. And again, if you need, you can write to me, I can tell you. But there are a lot of investors who only want to invest in companies that have green technology. Right? So, I would say yes, go ahead. Our next question is from Mr. Sharma. How to estimate size of an unstructured market or SMEs in India? There are not many reports available from Gartner's or KPMG's on domain specific SMEs. Or SMEs. Okay. Okay. See, a size of a market is often very, very difficult to estimate. It's, it's, uh, we face that a lot of issues because a lot of times the market is very, very fragmented and as a result, the exact numbers are not uh, available. Uh, and you could face that. So I'm assuming that you're you know, from one of the industries where information is not available. Um, what we do in such cases is we try to understand uh, multiple markets. We try to understand uh, so one number that you will always have is the size of SMEs in India. You can go to MSME website and they will give you the list of SMEs in India. So that is your uh, that is your outer limit, right? You cannot exceed that. And within that, how many SMEs are focused on, uh, on, on infrastructure? How many SMEs are focused on um, paint and chemicals? How many SMEs? Even that is available from the MSME uh, industry. So this Google MSME, uh, Ministry of and you should find out uh, 
the, the, the website and a lot of information is available. So they publish annual reports where they get you the details of uh, you know, how many industries or how many SMEs are available. Uh, but again, that is a very, very uh, rough number. So it's, you know, it is not exact. Uh, so what, what we do in such cases is if we get roundabout numbers, we give a band. So we say to the investor that the market size is anywhere between uh, 100 million to uh, 200 million, right? So you have to be, you can, you can have a band, but it has to be, I would say it has to be uh, realistic. You cannot give a band saying it's between 100 million and uh, 5 billion, right? You cannot give such a big band, but you can at least have a narrow range and say that, you know, my maximum I have 10,000 SMEs, and I think minimum there would be at least 5,000 SMEs based on my assumptions and there, there lies my uh, market or there lies my addressable clients. So you have to give a band and you can say that using assumptions and most of them, would, most of the investors understand that information is not available. So they will go through the working, you know, they will go through the mathematics that you have done to arrive at this number. And if they agree with it, they will say it's, it's correct, but at least they will appreciate you for giving a try. So, Whatever you do, uh, based on whatever assumptions you have, uh, you label them clearly and say, I've assumed this because of this information available from the MSME government. Uh, the 12th five-year plan that is currently being, being, uh, being done, a lot of information is available from that as well. So you can look at the 12th five-year plan that's available on the Government of India website. A lot of information that's not done by Gartner and, and KPMG or ENY uh, is available from the government. Uh, government sources. Okay, so as we have already run out of time, we'll take last question for the day. Uh, what is idea validation? What factors one has to consider? Uh, see, an idea valid validation happens at multiple levels. So, um, validation A could be the proof of concept of the product itself. B, it could be of the value that you provide. C, it could be the price point that you uh, are charging for that particular product. And D, it could be the uh, long-term sustenance of the product. So if you say, you know, A, I have a good product, solves a need, I've priced it correctly, and I have customers who are willing to come and renew their contract so that I have a multiple year contract, or they keep buying my product, or they keep using my product, you know, that is what an investor looks for. So validation of idea A can mean so for example, I just explained about the restaurant. I mean, you could have a small prototype, I give it to a customer and ask him, has it solved your problem? And if a customer says yes and I'm willing to pay money for it, uh, that is validation of your idea. If the customer is saying, I will give you money, go and make that product, that is definitely a validation of that you know? So you're actually getting money from the customer for actually going ahead and doing. So a lot of my clients have bought their first order from customers after giving, after raising, uh, after receiving the money for the product from the customer, right? So you don't necessarily need funding all the time. A customer could actually pay you for the product uh, to go and build it, and then you could build it for him. So there are different ways of, but I would say, A, find customers that need your product. B, uh, make sure that they, they value it. If they value it, let, use their inputs and make it valuable. C, um, decide a price point for your product, and D, make sure that they renew their purchase or they keep buying their product or you know refer your product to someone else. And if it's a service, make sure they keep using a service. Or maybe for someone to use a service. Okay. Thank you very much Mr. Matthews for that interesting session. Thank you to all our attendees for participating in the webinar. We are glad that the questions kept coming in, but due to lack of time we are unable to answer all. Please do send in your feedback and suggestions to us at eclub at indianglobal.org. Also, if you found the session interesting, feel free to blog or post about it. The recorded version of the webinar will be available on our website eclub.anionline.org by tomorrow and YouTube as well. Do join us for our next webinar on how to distribute equity between co-founders. Expert Mr. Chandu Nair, co-founder of Scope eKnowledge on 5th December from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Thank you once again and have a nice evening. Thank you.